the story starts for me growing up in a small Norfolk village and uh, it felt very, very small at the time. And I always dreamt of freedom. For a lot of my friends, the freedom really came when they got their first car, like a Ford Fiesta and ripped it around the local lanes. But for me, it came in two forms, flying and my bicycle. On my 12th birthday, my dad got me a flight at Tibidum Gliding Club. Um, and I really loved the experience of silently circling above the fields with the wind whistling through the little window. And uh, I was hooked from that moment on. My early flying career, uh, I got as much as I could um, in any way I could. So I joined Beckles Air Cadets uh, and I flew in the Grob Tutors, helicopters like the Squirrel and the Sea King. Um, I was awarded a flying scholarship and got two um, weeks, including 20 hours of flying at Dundee to fly solo. And I joined the 611 VGS gliding school in Watton, where I was there volunteering for three years, training to be instructors uh, and instructor on the Viking gliders. On my 16th birthday, my dad got me another present that changed my life. And that was this. It's, um, it's a steel bike frame that he got from uh, a friend of his who uh, owned a bike shop that he used to live above. So this was in the back of the shop. It was an old uh, Doors touring bike that had been stripped for parts. All the parts had gone for other bikes. Um, and he gave it to me just like this on my 16th birthday. And I used parts that I bought on eBay and secondhand and scrounged from from the side of the road, old wheels and things like that. Uh, and I taught myself to build up every part of a bike from running the cables, fitting the bottom bracket and building my own wheels as well. Over the next summer, I cycled from Norwich to Genoa in Northern Italy. And then the following year, I cycled from Norwich to Barcelona and all the way back. And at the time, all I had was an Atlas map and I traced with a pencil roughly where I was gonna go. I woke up every morning, started the morning with the sun to my left and kept cycling with the sun to straight ahead of me at midday for lunch of fresh, fresh French bread and then the sun to my right as I finished the day. In the following years, I moved to London for work, which made my pursuit of flying a little bit more complicated in terms of powered flying or, or fixed wing gliding. Um, but around that time, I saw this documentary online called Temple in the Clouds. And this was really the kind of opening of my eyes to the paragliding world. And what really excited me about it was the ability for a real expedition, like the trips I'd done already on the bike, being able to cover serious ground with the flying machine in a rucksack. If you haven't seen that documentary, I will share the link to it afterwards um, but here's a little clip so you get a taster of of why i found this so uh, exciting at the time my name is jim allenson this is my friend enrico patuzzi aka kiko and this is the story of our journey to the temples in the clouds The temple of Himani Chamunda is on the mighty Dauladhar mountain range, which runs west from our takeoff point at Billing towards Dharamsala, the home of the Dalai Lama. It is only 40 kilometers away from Billing, but is rarely reachable by paraglider because it is almost always in the clouds by the time one gets there. We plan to stop and camp for a night along the way so that we can take off early the next day and reach the temple before the clouds descend. It's amazing to see the kind of uh, well all of the equipment but even the film you know the film equipment is so fun there the music choice and the editing is, is quite fun to watch these days when you look at what's on YouTube but um, still really watching it today the story of the journey and the way they're able to travel with paragliders is is still inspiring uh, when I watch it back after I saw that documentary I got back on the bike and I cycled across Spain um, to fly Spain 
and that's where I learned to fly um, literally the next year and then the next year after that in 2018 my work and life lined up and I decided to go go for it with my biggest dream of all which was to cycle around the world and now with my newfound passion for paragliding there was no way I wasn't gonna figure a way to bring my paraglider with me so I packed up my stove and uh, my laptop my bivy and I got a lightweight bee glider it's the Skywalk Ariba um, with all the cycling I was doing uh, I was super light <laughs> so I got that smallest version that you can buy um, which helped with the size as well and the weight I got the Niviet Roma 2 harness and uh, a reserve as well and an extra helmet and that all fitted inside the bike uh, pannier bag along the top of my uh, my touring bike I planned my first leg from London to Sofia in Bulgaria and uh, I, I departed the day after the royal wedding so as I rode out from Buckingham Palace they had the Union Jacks left up I like to think they left them up for me down the mall I cycled with a group of friends and family to Canterbury on the first day um, and then the next day I was alone on my way to Dover and across to Europe the first leg was uh, the first chance I'd had to try all the kit together and it was far and away the heaviest bike I'd ever ridden even with certain things that I kind of threw away along the first few days that I realized I didn't really need the bike together with the kit the full panniers the bar bag and the paraglider came to almost 50 kilos I was using the Camus app to plan the routes which went pretty well um, and pretty smoothly across um, across France and uh, Belgium the Netherlands um, until I got to Switzerland where I went off the nice smooth roads down what turned out to be a smaller and smaller and smaller path um, and as I was kind of spinning and going into a low and lower and gear all of these Swiss cyclists were passing me always all on full sus mountain bikes um, all going super fast you know in full lycras and everything like that so my huge 50 kilogram bike I wound my way up this path it got narrower and narrower and I dropped well into the lowest gear I had to get off and push the path turned into a full-on mountain bike track I had to stop multiple times I was dripping in sweat and it took me two or three hours to get to the top of the trail and by the time I got there all the mountain bikers were sitting in a cafe sipping a cup of coffee and gave me a little round of applause as I appeared over the horizon that's the track there heading off into the hills Sofia was my first paragliding stop um, I was also stopping there to work in a co-working space in the city and what I loved about the the city is that you could or I could check out from work a little bit early I could get on this bus that took me up Vitosha which is a massive um, that towers over the capital and in a couple of hours I could be flying flying along the ridge there picking up small thermals um, or heading down into the landing field to hitchhike back into town it was a nice calm introduction to flying the more extreme mountain flying that were to come um, and I spent several days there between between work um, flying around the local area here's the video of that uh, that experience <laughs> Made it to the top. Two hours, two buses winding up the little roads here. Clouds are closed in a bit, but there's still about 2,000 meters, which is about 200 meters above launch. So we'll see if we can get a nice little top to bottom in. Clouds means no thermals, but we still get a good half an hour flight when the launch is uh, almost 2,000 meters high.
So the next leg was from Sofia in Bulgaria via Istanbul and down south to Olodanis. After a few days of staying in Istanbul, I took uh, a ferry to Madanya, which leaves directly from the center of Istanbul, which helped save some cycling through uh, Istanbul's infamous traffic, which I'd spent two or three days um, on cycling into um, Istanbul from the west. So far in the trip, I'd stayed pretty fit and healthy. It was about a month in at this point. Um, however, I made my first mistake by buying a lukewarm pastry on the ferry. And whatever was still living in that pastry took just a long enough for me to cycle about 100 kilometers away from the nearest town along these incredible remote gravel trails throughout rural Turkey to really hit me hard. And I spent uh, just over a night and a day um, vomiting in my tiny little bivy or under a nearby tree, using up all the extra supplies of water and food that I had until after those 36 hours of sickness, I pushed my bike into the nearest small village, which was just a few small house, houses with no shops or, or public water either. I stopped in the street and some local women were were uh, hanging up washing and noticed my plight looking at me and immediately realizing that I wasn't well. And one of the families took me in, uh, gave me fresh bread, fresh tomatoes. I really remember the, the taste of the tomatoes, a uh, toilet to use, which was critical at the time. And I lay sleeping in their courtyard under a tree for the remainder of that day, which brought me back to life. They filled up my bottles of water, gave me some extra tomatoes and dates, and I was able to continue on the journey, building up the distance and as my strength regained over the coming days. That's the infamous ferry. I didn't get a photo of the pasty. Oladenis was my next stop, and this was a real shock as a you know new, newly qualified pilot. Um, and also just being from cycling in Turkey, to uh, to being around Brits abroad on holiday as well. I got a fantastic apartment and I loved watching gliders come down onto the beach and I unpacked my wing and had a ground handle on the beach. As I'm sure anyone who's been to Olympus knows, it's an incredible place to be as someone that loves paragliding. My first flight from Babadag launch was genuinely terrifying. I, having flown from a maximum of four or 500 meter high launches in Spain during my training, um, that 2000 meter drop away from the launch to the sea really took my breath away. Also, I found fighting with the lightweight wing on the smooth bricks um, was really tricky. The wing kept skittering kind of left and right in the, the wind as it came around the, the side of the launch there. And obviously, again, as anyone who's been to Alertness will know, um, the bus loads after bus loads of tandems that shoulder, showed you out the way were um, key elements that added to the workload. But I soon got to the hang of things. I learned how to kind of choose the better launches, not just going for the one that all the tandems are going for. Sometimes picking some of the higher launches that were a little quieter and picking my time to fly. I particularly enjoyed sunrise flights, getting up early and being on the first minibuses um, to, to be there for sunrise. This is one of my most memorable flights where I got up early enough that there was a, still a layer of cloud well below at a few hundred meters high and I was able to play around in the clouds.
I also did an epic hike and fly. Uh, I left before sunrise and climbed the full height of Babadag on foot, um, which took over four hours of hiking and scrambling. At the time, they were just finishing building the cable car, so they had the path sort of became the the construction tracks higher up. Um, and I got there as a lot of the minibuses were arriving uh, to the launch site. Unfortunately, it's something that's not maybe not as possible to do now. I tried when I was there la uh, last year, but with the new ticketing system, you have to be you have to buy your ticket for the, that day at 10 a.m. from the 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 ticket booth down the bottom. So unless you leave a lot later, um, it's not so good for for hiking up there now. Maybe there's a way you can sneak around the uh, security at the top. I don't know. For the next leg, um, I took I rode across the entire of Turkey, which if I if I didn't know it at the time, I now know is incredibly mountainous country. Over just two weeks of cycling, I climbed over three times the height of Everest. A lot of it on um, gravel trails, very very remote gravel trails. Um, the scenery was vast, and some of the favorite, some of my favorite in the trip by far. I would camp on one side of the mountains in the forest with nobody around for miles and miles and miles. The nearest people would be a small speck of a village on the other side of the valley, which you could judge the scale by by the minarets of the mosques which were tiny little dots in the distance along the way i saw many roman sites across turkey um, but one of the highlights for me for sure was the ishak pasha palace which is this incredible structure that overlooks this vast valley and on the other side is turkey's largest mountain which is a, a dormant volcano which uh, even towards the end of the summer had um, a huge amount of snow on top and it was visible for about two to three days while I was cycling uh, up to this plateau. So my next stop was uh, Tbilisi, where I'd be stopping, um, again, renting another apartment to work um, and be based for a few weeks. Before I reached the city, I joined the Georgian Paragliding Federation pa Facebook page, and um, it was a great connection. Within a few days, they let me know they were doing some training on a local grassy slope which overlooks the capital which itself is in a long uh, river valley and so i flew some top to bottoms getting uh, a lift up in a pickup truck back to the top and to repeat uh, and made some friends there which came in handy later on uh, in in the week i rented a 4x4 and i drove out into the mountains with uh, some sites in mind that i've been told about by my new uh, Georgian paragliding friends. I spent a night sleeping in a freezing 4x4 um, before I reached the Georgia-Russia Peace Monument um, where there was a paragliding site nearby. When I got to the site there was two groups of pilots, there was the Georgian and the Russian and they definitely weren't very friendly despite the name of the monument and they were competing to run tandems up the valley um, for the sort of small flow of tourists that were coming through. If I thought that Oludinus was intimidating at the time, these mountains were even more so for a green pilot like me. The wind was whipping up the valley and there was about 20 to 30 kilometer hike from the bottom landing if you didn't make it for the top landing. But it was incredibly invigorating as well. Uh, I took off, I flew over the valley, over the Peace Monument uh, and did back up top landings, did a few flights down to the valley and even um, joined some of the tandems and took off tandem flight as well while I was there. Some of the tandems were going up above this peak at the back. The camera lens makes the scale, uh, you know, it, it stretches the scale a little bit, but the mountain at the back was up to 5,000 meters high. Here's a little clip from that.
by this time, the winter was fast approaching and I had a big decision to make. I could spend about six months in Tbilisi or Baku in Azerbaijan, just in the Caucasus area generally, and wait for the snow to thaw in Kazakhstan and the, the, um, the stands in general. Or I could spend my winter by taking one flight on the beaches of Goa partying. So the decision wasn't too tricky. I boxed up the bike and I hopped on a flight to Mumbai. Uh, I rode out of the center of the city um, to sit on the beach and also saw the cliffs of Goa as well to bring in the new year in style. Over the next six months, I cycled the length and breadth of India down as far as Kochi, Bangalore and Pondicherry and then right through the center of the country in Delhi and onto the Himalayas. India was constantly busy. I had non-stop crowds and attention the whole time I was traveling and it was by far the longest leg. I traveled thousands and thousands of kilometers and village to village with little to no gap. It's truly a country of a million villages. The diverse culture and religion and the kindness of the people and also for me as a vegetarian, the unlimited super hearty food made it by far my, one of my favorite um, and most rewarding uh, legs of the trip on the bike. Overall, I spent seven months in India and Nepal. Um, so again, by far one of the largest uh, portions of my trip. After a year of cycling, I finally reached the Himalayas where I was in the, uh, the world of the Temple of the Clouds documentary. From my hostel window, I could see the snowy mountains of beer behind. And I made a habit of walking up to launch, making friends with visited pilots from around the world, as well as the local mountain dogs who hiked up to launch. And on some off days when it wasn't flyable, we went for longer hikes and the, the dogs are always friendly and following as well. It's also where I met Robin and his group on the, the launch as well. And it really lived up to its expectations for me. Um, I, looking back, really, I, you know, I never flew beyond that first ridge um, with the kit that I had and the experience that I had. But still flying along that ridge was the furthest I'd ever flown. Um, and also learned a lot from the pilots that were there. I remember speaking a lot on launch and in the evenings at the, um, the landing side cafes and just learning so much as well as by learning by flying with the vultures and uh, seeing their amazing, amazing majesty and uh, prowess in, in thermaling versus my performance on the, uh, on the green wing. few hundred kilometers along the road I reached Pokhara um, and here I learned a useful lesson about flying with feel. As with beer I was in an amazing routine I had a great apartment overlooking the lake and I'd wake up in the morning go to a local cafe for breakfast before hiking up in time for the thermals to begin kicking off around allegedly 10 10 30 in the morning and on the third or fourth day of flying I hiked up with an American pilot who I'd got to know the day before when I opened my bag and I found that my Cyride Vario had been turned itself on in the bag overnight and the battery was completely drained. So I was completely sullen and I took off thinking that I would just have a top to bottom and go and try and hunt in town for some new batteries. When just as I got towards that gaggle of pilots that you can see, uh, which was a regular sight over the house thermal, I felt the, uh, the wing pulling forward 
and then rocking back into the thermal. I could look around at the small sub bridges at the side and see the parallax effect of the trees in the background rising behind the trees in the foreground falling away. And um, I turned into the thermal and I paid attention to all the gliders around me, the birds around me, the seeds and grass in the air. And that flight was the longest flight I had of the whole time in Pokhara uh, with no vario. And I loved every every second of it, feeling the air and really learning how um, to, to, to feel the signs of the air moving around you. There was quite a distance to the next paragliding site I was heading for, which was Bali with the cliffs and the, the big volcano on the north side. Um, my ride led me through the rest of Nepal um, up to um, Tilicho Lake, which is an ice covered, snow covered lake on the Annapurna circuit. Um, through Assam and Manipur, which are the eastern states of India, through Myanmar with its golden pagodas, looping through Laos, Vietnam, uh, the Angkor Wat temple complex in Cambodia. I slept on beach hammocks in Thailand, across Malaysia to Singapore. And finally, I caught a ferry from Singapore to Jakarta uh, for my final ride across Java Island to get the ferry to Bali. This was just before... Um, my life changed as it did everyone this was march time 2020 so i was heading towards bali to meet up with um my now wife actually we were meeting there um to to spend a week or two working together when and she'd been following more closely the news about coronavirus i've been hearing little bits here and there um, when i was in jakarta but i didn't really know a lot about it i wouldn't sh wasn't sure really what the impact would be on my trip but she called me to say that it looked like it was going to be more serious than we th first thought. So I made a few calls and realized I needed to get back to the UK. So I was at this point 300 kilometers away from Jakarta in a small town. So I managed to find a taxi driver who I could pay $50 to to drive me the, the 300 kilometers overnight in time for me to find a, a bike box, pack up all my gear and get on a flight the next day. So within 24 hours, I went from uh, from cycling across every inch of the world to flying in 18 hours over the world that would take me 18 months to travel um, by bike. And it really felt bittersweet to say the least. The trip wasn't finished and I was coming home to a lot of uncertainty. But looking back at the map on the, the plane as I flew by, I remembered that I'd been to the birthplace of Buddha and the birthplace of Stalin on my trip. I visited cathedrals, palaces, mosques and temples. I spent nearly 300 nights sleeping wild under the stars and I've been invited to stay with local families in a dozen countries, many more than I was able to talk about today. Yet it became very, very clear as I landed as well that the trip would no longer have been possible. The next day as I was on the plane, the Indonesian government stopped all ferry um, journeys between the islands. And Australia, which was my next planned trip uh, or planned leg, closed their borders for much of the next year. So overall, in my round the world cycling attempt, I cycled 25,000 kilometers over 25 different countries. And I flew in some of the world's best paragliding sites. I learned that often the tourist sites are not the most beautiful or the best food or the best places to stay. It's the least trodden places that are the best and most beautiful gems. I learned that it's possible to push your limits I learned that in paragliding, you've got friends all around the world who will support you and they're all doing the crazy things that you're doing. And above all, I learned how large the world really is by covering only a quarter of its circumference, pedal stroke by pedal stroke. Thank <laughs> you.
So since I've been back in the UK, I've been focusing on a few adventures that I had on the bucket list that weren't possible to tie up with a round the world trip. Most recently, I cycled across the Hajar Mountains in Oman, um, which again, I climbed the height of Everest in six days, um, camping wild in the desert. And um, I've been uh, taking part in the hike and fly scene here in uh, the UK. So I started with the Dragon Hike and Fly last year, um, and I'm doing both the Dragon Hike and Fly and the X Lakes um, this year. And I'm hoping to build up on those trips, as well as some solo hike and fly adventures um, in the coming months as well and years. I'm also at the Norfolk Toe Club quite regularly, where I've actually got my my personal best distance flight is still uh, at the Norfolk Club. So we get some serious distance, especially because we've got an, this nice electric winch, which gives us some uh, good height in thermic conditions. Um, and living in London, I'm regularly flying in the South Downs and Thames Valley, Southeast Wales as well. You can see all of the extended video diaries and written diaries as well from the trip. Um, on my website, which is benbola.com. And I'm sure I'll see, and I've, I've recognized a few of your names as well. So I'm sure you, I'll see you all on, uh, on hills around the country and uh, the world soon as well. Thank you very much.